This is Boot Camp, where we find out what it takes to serve in the U.S. military. From the challenges new recruits face in Navy Boot Camp, Get off my deck now! to advanced training that prepares soldiers to be Army tankers and Cav Scouts. We begin with what Army snipers go through in sniper school. These soldiers are training to be U.S. Army snipers. Before this seven-week training course is done, more than half of them will be dropped from training. I think when you actually get down here on the ground and you're actually performing the role of a sniper, it's a lot different from what a lot of people would instantly think. Oh, yeah. Most of the time you're laying somewhere you don't want to lay for a lo way longer than you thought you would be. And sometimes it's fruitless and sometimes it's not. This is the U.S. Army Sniper Course. Let's go, guy. Keep moving. Where soldiers from the Army and National Guard learn essential skills in sniper field craft and marksmanship. Soldiers leaving here are going to leave a more lethal soldier than they were prior to arriving. There are more than 2,000 snipers currently serving in the U.S. Army. Their primary mission? Placing long-range precision fire on key targets. But being a sniper goes beyond pulling a trigger. Let's go! Insiders spent two days at the U.S. Army Sniper Course at Fort Benning observing different classes at various stages of training, including marksmanship, range estimation, target detection, and stalks. To be accepted into the sniper course, prospective students must meet a range of prerequisites, which include passing a psychological evaluation and physical fitness test, achieving expert qualification with the M4 carbine, and receiving a recommendation letter from their battalion commander. Attributes to make a good sniper to attend the United States Army Sniper Corps would be a, a disciplined soldier, the ability to think on their feet, but the ability to grow through updated doctrine. Although both male and females are eligible for entry, only one female student has attended the course, graduating in 2021. Training is split into two categories field craft, and marksmanship. All right, five minutes to drive for kids now. During marksmanship training, students get familiarized with three different rifles. The M2010 Enhanced Sniper Rifle, the M110 SAS, and the M107. Shooting has always been the fun thing to do. You know, it's what everyone wants to go do. They want to go shoot. Working in pairs, students learn to hit targets from 600 to 1,100 meters away, alternating between the shooter and spotter positions. All right, so you're going to dial five point, up 5.4. Before participating in graded events, the soldiers spend time on the range gathering and confirming dope or data on previous engagements, which includes temperature, altitude, humidity, and even the weight and velocity of their ammunition. Give me a 7.8 elevation. This data informs the shooters of how to adjust their rifles in order to hit their targets in any situation. For the target, stand by for wind. Students also have to account for wind and how to properly read it on the path to their target. Left point two. So basically they're just looking for the wind, what the elements are doing around them, and then giving wind calls based off that. Left point three. Students use a unit of measurement called milliradians, or mills, represented by the hash marks inside the shooter's scope to determine the wind's effect on their shot. Left point seven. Left point seven. Left point seven. So they're just telling the whole point five left or point two left, and it's actually going inside their reticle. Those were all bad wind calls on my part. You are yeah, very fine. bad. Like opposite direction on which you need to be calling the wind bad. They have several opportunities to practice reading wind and gather dope with the M2010 ahead of their first graded record fire, which takes place during week three. I think this is the part of sniper school that everyone really likes that come here because they get to shoot, 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 and you don't get to do this a lot in a normal army world. Point eight. 
I personally love it. That's why I came to sniper school. I love shooting. It's the most time that I've ever gotten on the gun, so it's definitely good practice. All right, target's up. Chase, walk. Wind One. becomes an even bigger factor during movers training, where students practice firing at moving targets. When you go down range, your targetry, i.e. the enemy, doesn't typically want to stay in one spot when you start shooting at them. So this helps them get into the right mindset and get them the tools and techniques so they can engage those targets effectively. Working in pairs, students fire at moving targets ranging from 200 to 600 meters away and have two minutes to move between firing positions. One, one mil. I got one. Yeah, that's what I got too. Shooters measure the target's speed in mils and must factor in their movement when determining where to aim their shot. Lead's gonna be 0.8. <laughs> Wind's moving from right to left. So they're calling out those numeric values in mils based on what they should be holding left, right of the target as it moves across the range. What'd you hold? 1.2. All this is really entails is you getting an accurate hold in front of the target so that as it moves towards the center of your reticle, you will then fire preemptively so that the bullet will meet with the target as it moves across the range. It's going to be a point seven. Going right to left, uh, go one mil. It can be very confusing determining what side of the target you should be holding on. Should I be adding mils to the target as I'm going with the wind? Should I be taking mils away as I'm going against the wind? Point eight five five times one. Equals right to left. Point eight hold. Your shooter and the spotter both need to be talking. They both need to be talking about where the wind's coming from and trying to come up with those numbers in their head so that makes it a little bit easier to do that fast math in your head. What are you going to go, point six here now? Yeah, left point five, left point six. As we start to go deeper and deeper into the training, they get better at it and we almost have a 100% pass rate with movers. So when you have a magazine in, you're going to want to settle it a little low. Although roughly 50% of the sniper course involves firing weapons, marksmanship isn't the sole focus of training. A sniper's secondary mission is to collect and report battlefield information, but nine times out of 10, that's the mission you're gonna end up doing. In order to collect battlefield information undetected, students must master a wide array of fieldcraft skills, starting with how to properly construct a ghillie suit. Ghillie suits are a type of camouflage clothing that snipers use to blend in with their environment. We use natural vegetation as well. We tie that into our suit and it helps us to blend in with whatever environment we could potentially be working in. Students bring their own ghillie suits to the sniper course, which are usually constructed using an old uniform. There's seriously no rules to it. Anything you want, the sky's the limit and it's honestly up to the user. To help achieve that blending effect, Netting and artificial camouflage, like jute, a fibrous plant-based material, are used to break up the wearer's silhouette. You might want to try to extend this some here to break up this straight line. Their ghillie suits are inspected at least three times while at the course. We do a 360 inspection ensuring that there are points that generally get blown out, such as the crotch of the pants, armpits, elbows, stuff like that. Those high wear and tear areas are reinforced, they're, they're sewn down, they're glued. The ghillie suit's constructed with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. It's, uh, it's not fun. You're just sewing through all your like areas that could potentially rip, I'm taking a lot of time with really, really thick needles and yarn and a lot of glue. So I have probably eight to 10 hours worth into my ghillie suit now, including all the sewing and everything. And I'd say that it's probably around a seven out of 10, but I, there's always more you could do to it. If constructed properly, a ghillie suit can last a sniper their entire career. So durability is key. Hurry up, move. He's moving. And it'll get put to the test during an event known as the ghillie wash. Hurry up. The ghillie wash serves two purposes, to season and add color to the students' ghillie suits and to test the suit's durability under pressure. They know it's coming. Everybody who comes to the school talks about it and they all know kind of what to expect. Students start off by crawling and rolling across various terrains, including pavement, gravel, and sand before getting sprayed by a fire hose, which adds weight to their ghillie suits. Up, down, up. We incorporate exercises to make sure that they don't have any kind of tearing and seams and stuff like that. Up, up, down, 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 down. 
it's very important that you continue to push and it's very, very important that you're able to get to and from wherever you're going with the small amount of people that you have. <sighs> Students then crawl on their stomachs and backs through muddy trenches to add color to their suits. We're trying to get that color deeply rooted in the fabric. Crawling through the trench and under the sticks over there, I would say that would be the top smoker. It was like crawling on your back on a treadmill. You weren't going anywhere. It kind of sucked. It's tough. I had mud in my eyes the whole time, so I just couldn't see anything. I was pretty much running blind, crawling blind across the roads and stuff. Being physically fit and being able to endure any kind of physical activities is definitely very, very important because as a sniper, you're going to be moving further with more weight than the average soldier. For the final leg of the ghillie wash, they crawl through a 200-foot-long trench filled with water ranging in depth from a couple inches to a couple feet. With their ghillie suits now weighed down with water, students must make their way over walls and obstacles of varying heights, all while maintaining a low profile. We have them low crawling over any kind of like obstacles and stuff like that, see if the area that they drag themselves on will possibly peel up, and again, any kind of stitching is gonna rip. Honestly, it felt really good, the cold water, because of how hot it was outside, but crawling over all of the rocks and the sand was definitely uncomfortable. It is a very physical event, but it's completely necessary. Like we have to test out these ghillie suits to make sure they're gonna withstand the test of time. Generally across the board, you can usually see all smiles. Everybody's pretty happy. Everybody has their own little story of what happened to them. It's good. I'm very filthy right now. I have a lot of dirt in a lot of places. With their ghillie suits seasoned, students are ready to continue with the rest of their field craft training. Eyes up. During range estimation exercises, students must determine the distance to a given target using nothing but their eyes and rifle scope. Before the exercise begins, they take measurements of their target, which in this case was an instructor and a vehicle. They get all the measurements from waist to top of the head, waist to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, or from toes to top of the head, as well as multiple measurements on the vehicle itself so that they can measure out with their optic the size of the target at distance. Eyes up. During the exercise, students use only their eyes to estimate how far the target is at 10 different distances, varying from 300 to 1,000 meters. They teach us brackets. If it's in the 1 to 200 meter bracket, it's in the 2 to 300 meter bracket, and then we choose like if it's closer to 300 or the 200. It's still a challenge to do by eye, but using the reticle, as long as you have proper measurements, it's all just math. When using their scopes, students are taught to use the mill relation formula, which takes the height of the target in inches, multiplied by a constant, and then divided by the target's height in mills. The resulting number is the distance to the target in meters. To be successful, their estimates must be within 5% of the actual distance, and they must accurately record at least 14 out of the 20 ranges to pass their graded exercise. Of the class we observed, two students failed. They have one more opportunity to pass, or they'll be dropped from the sniper course. It's an extremely important skill to be able to range estimate accurately as a sniper because we may not be in an environment that is permissive enough to allow us to use technology to estimate our range to our target. So snipers need to know how to be able to measure and do the mill relation formula in order to determine their range to target. All right, turn around, get in the prone, eyes down. During target detection training, students scan a field in front of them for 10 military-related items that have been strategically hidden by instructors some as small as a couple of inches. Target detection is a sniper's ability to detect anomalies in their environment. We run them through a series of exercises here at the schoolhouse that reinforces their searching patterns, searching techniques, and their ability to actually pick up on anomalies. Using their eyes, scopes, and binoculars, the class is given 40 minutes to search for the objects in a 10,000 square meter field and must accurately locate and record at least seven to be successful.
Honestly, it's only difficult if you're looking for items. If you don't look for something specific and you just scan the area, they'll pop out at you because the human eye hates patterns. So when you see a disruption in a pattern, it, it pops out at you. Students are taught several scanning techniques and look out for various target indicators, such as shine, shape, texture, and contrast to the background environment. The human eye naturally scans left to right, top to bottom, and one thing that they hit on that was really big was scanning bottom to top, right to left. It kind of forces your mind to not go its natural path. You pick up things a lot easier. I'm looking around this area right here and realizing the way the bark naturally looks, they see this natural dis uh, difference right here where the pattern's messed up and there's no longer any bark and focusing a little bit more on it, you're able to find the, uh, the texture of the plastic, color doesn't add up, it's not that gray or that black anymore, you got a little bit of a green, uh, it might catch some kind of sheen coming off of it. Of the class we observed, one student failed and was dropped from the sniper course. Field craft skills such as target detection are vital to their future careers as snipers. If you see anything of note, you log it down in one form or another. As a sniper, you're always doing that throughout an entire mission. So ultimately, that, that is the most important job of a sniper. And it's the one that's ultimately most valuable to the commander because now he's getting a better picture of the objective or the battlefield. Fieldcraft training culminates with stalk events, where pairs of students must navigate through wooded terrain to observe their assigned target without being spotted by the instructors walking around them or by those observing from afar with binoculars. Students perform four practical stalk training exercises before moving on to graded events. The class we observed was participating in their first practical exercise. They're given 10 minutes to prepare themselves and their equipment. The class covers themselves in natural vegetation that matches their surroundings, utilizing hair ties and 550 cord that they've glued to their ghillie suits. In order to truly blend in with your environment, to get rid of the human signatures of the sides of the head, shoulders, the areas that are distinguishable, you have to tie in vegetation to your foreground, background, everything around you. We just put like a real thick base layer on and took off towards the objective. Once the event begins, students have two hours to reach an area from which they can observe their target, which in this case was a truck, and they must utilize the movement techniques they've been taught to stay out of sight. Freeze, you two. What do you think you look like right now walking through the woods? Stupid dude with a, a dude in the So if a team is trying to rush up to the objective, like not moving tactically or in the movement techniques that would, they have been previously taught, we'll stop them, we'll take their roster numbers down and they'll get docked 10 points. And they'll also get moved back 100 meters or a terrain feature away, whichever one is further, and have them restart after explaining what they did wrong. They can also get spotted by the observers watching from the back of the truck with 10 power binoculars who then direct instructors walking in the woods to the student's location. Yeah, Roger, it's probably this guy right here that I got my flag on. He was uh, facing away from the truck, so it's probably his back that you saw. All right, so you guys tracking, right? Yo, so thick is good, right? Getting in that thick spot is good, but you're playing a dangerous game, right? Because you're mixing the potential of overhead movement. And look how close you guys are to the objective. You are way too close to be causing this much movement. It was kind of a shock to everyone how easily they could spot us. Once the students reach a spot in which they're able to view the truck, they set up their final firing position, camouflaging themselves and their equipment to match their new surroundings. They must then observe and correctly record a scenario that takes place, which in this case included two instructors setting up and firing a mortar round. They're annotating and formulating what they observed into what we call a salute report as well as generating a call for fire request. The students then have to accurately identify two letters held up by the observers on the back of the truck. Letter it up. Letter is up on time. Shooter, you got an ID? Julia. Time. What was it? Julia. It's a good ID. Good ID. But in order to pass the exercise, the students must evade detection by the observers scanning for them, which can be easier said than done. So I've got Apex of the Triangle on top of the spotter's head. 
you guys are standing and you open with the sun on your back, right? That naturally is going to cast shadow or catch glint off your optic. You were able to observe the scenario and you both PID the letter. That's good. That's really good. That's what we want, but none of that matters if you guys are able to be seen. By the end of the practical exercise we observed, none of the participating students received a passing grade. I think uh, a lot of them went in with maybe a little bit too much confidence and they thought, well, it, it looks pretty thick, so I'm sure they won't see me. The problem is the instructors that work here currently, they, they have a lot of experience, both real world and here at the schoolhouse. It's a challenge. It was pretty frustrating, but at the end of the day, like, I think that I'm more motivated now than before because I know that I need to improve on things. So I definitely have things I need to focus on to get better, but I'm excited to do the next rep. This class will have three more practical stalk exercises before starting their graded events, of which they'll have three opportunities to pass. But according to the Army, the majority of students from this class did not pass their graded stalk events and were dropped from the course. Sergeant Terry. On average, just 47% of the 288 students who are accepted to the sniper course each year end up graduating. Those who are able to successfully complete the course will go on to teach the skills they've learned to the junior soldiers in their unit and could be deployed into combat as snipers immediately if necessary. It's extremely rewarding to watch a soldier that has a small understanding of the weapon platform or the techniques to employ as a sniper. And once they graduate the course, their ability to perform as a sniper is outstanding. This is the MV-22 Osprey, flown by the United States Marine Corps. With a unit cost of about $84 million, it's the world's first production tilt rotor aircraft, which means it takes off and lands vertically like a helicopter, All right, go fast. but flies like a traditional turboprop airplane. We don't need that runway to land on, and we don't need any type of air traffic control agency to get us there. We can do it ourselves. When grounded, its rotor blades fold into itself, making it small enough to travel on naval carriers. The primary role uh, is what we call assault support. What that means is that we're good at carrying people and stuff places. When you're good to kiss off and maintain uh, 1,500 feet over the range. Insider spent a day at Marine Corps Air Station New River in North Carolina to find out what it takes to fly the Osprey. Before flying an Osprey, Marine Corps pilots must receive a four-year college degree and attend flight school to learn the basics. After that, you gain your wings and you show up at the fleet and you get about two months, three months to learn how to fly the Osprey. Osprey pilots spend 20 hours training in a simulator that was off limits to our cameras. I wanted to have a plane that was at the forefront of where the Marine Corps wanted to send things. Turns out that this was ex exactly the right plane for me. Today when we go fly, we're going to do a whole bunch of various flight profiles. We're going to go and shoot tail gunnery, and then we transition over to doing confined area landings. The training mission begins with a briefing in the squadron ready room. We're going to take off out of New River as a section. For the departure, it's going to be a standard vertical takeoff to climb up to our en route altitude of 3,500 feet. Safety is one of the most important topics of any Osprey mission briefing. Three U.S. Marines are missing right now off the coast of Australia. There have been 33 accidents, resulting in 42 reported deaths since the Osprey's first flight in 1989. The MV-22 originally, in its induction phases and in testing, unfortunately ended up having a few accidents along the way, things that were worked out essentially over the years. The Osprey became operational in 2007. And since then, safety components like nacelles and software have been redesigned and reconfigured. I have over 800 flight hours on this plane with, with zero issues. That's in no small part to the maintenance efforts that are put forth by the Marines every day here. Crew chiefs at New River work as plane maintainers when they're not aiding on missions. Even the smallest things on the Osprey have to be looked at and are kept in good working order. We make sure that we're, we're flying the safest aircraft possible. Before every flight, Pilots and crew do a walkthrough of the Osprey to ensure everything is in working order. 
This is the Osprey, just a big overview here. Each engine provides you 6,150 shaft horsepower. So what that means for me up front is that I can go from zero to 280 knots and climb from the surface all, all the way up to 25,000 feet. This is the air to air refueling probe. This thing sticks out and lets me plug and refuel off of all kinds of different refueling assets and extends my range out beyond three hours out to all the way my limits that I can just stay awake for. These big nacelles here contain the engine itself and then also will contain all the different gearbox systems and different accessory drive systems that keep my aircraft powered up and flying both hydraulically and electrically. We have seats all up and down the left and right side that hold uh, 24 troops and then any type of cargo that we can do here. We have a lot of redundancy. We have three hydraulic systems. We have three flight control computers. We have four generators that will operate and they can all back each other up. So if any one component fails, there's numerous layers of backup and redundancy that allow this plane to keep flying and uh, keep fighting regardless of what happens. It is a gorgeous day to go fly. The downwash coming off of the Osprey is about the same as a Category 2 Hurricane. 170 at 9 for takeoff. Here for takeoff, runway 19, Elvis 1-1 one flight. Takeoff begins with the rotors in the vertical position lifting the plane off the ground. After reaching the desired altitude, pilots convert the aircraft to airplane mode. I have what's called a thumb wheel. On the throttle, uh, there is a, a little knob that I just move with my thumb. It's as easy as this. It takes little to no effort for me. What that means inside the plane and what the plane is doing is that I have uh, three different hydraulic systems that are controlling uh, what's called conversion actuators. And these conversion actuators are gigantic screws. And those screws uh, twist and make the whole nacelle structure move up and down. The crew flies north to begin the first exercise of the mission, firing the Osprey's machine gun at targets on the ground. On the MV-22, we have a ramp-mounted weapon system. We'll be firing the M240 Delta today, which is a 7.62 by 51 caliber uh, belt-fed machine gun. The ramp-mounted weapon system is used in a defensive role as we're carrying troops and cargo into an area. If we're engaged, we can effectively suppress that enemy fire or threat. The standard four-person Osprey crew consists of two pilots and two crew chiefs. So I'll be leading to the aircraft through the flight profile. Control level came back up. We're going to go ahead and try going fast again. I serve as the link between the pilots and the back of the plane. That's between our cargo, anyone we're carrying. I shoot the gun, uh, you name it. I suggest converting to see if we can get some of that back. Yep, one second. Copy. Sergeant Leneve will also be helping train an additional member on today's flight. I'm Lance Copo Trantham, and I'm a crew chief on the V-22 Osprey. Every day is a new challenge and a new opportunity to learn something. Today we're going to be simulating engagement by a surface-to-air threat, uh, which is going to be a missile system, and we're going to attempt to suppress that threat. All right, Lenny, we're coming uh, across the runway target now. There's multiple vehicles and stuff on the on the runway. All the fires are going to be north of the runway, so on the left side of the aircraft right now. Copy. I've got, got a target. Contact. Two targets. Steel targets. Crew chiefs train to aim and fire the M240 Delta using the plane's forward momentum. It definitely takes a lot of concentration um, with the effects of your forward momentum. Getting the rounds to hit your target, you have to aim in a certain way so that your rounds hit with the proper momentum. If their target is to the left of the plane, they aim low and left. If they shoot off the right side of the plane, they aim high and right. We're going to basically be looking for good uh, impacts on the target. In the training mission's second phase, the crew flies over a field to practice landing in a confined area without a runway. So we'll do uh, what we call tactical straight-ins, where we go from uh, airplane mode, um, going 240 knots, and bring it all the way to a hover inside the zone. So it's going to take us from this in route airplane, and then the computer and the software, the automation, is going to fly the plane all the way along a course of flight and bring us into a hover over a specific landing point. So it's pretty cool. Forward thrust comes off the propellers. That generates lift over the wing, just like any traditional fixed wing aircraft. Then, pilots redirect that thrust by converting into helicopter mode. We start shifting that lift vector backwards to slow ourselves down or forward to accelerate ourselves, and we go from there. 
After completing confined area landings and takeoffs, the focus shifts to the third exercise of the mission, training crew chiefs how to measure the plane's distance to the ground with just their eyes. Okay, guys, traffic start 10 o'clock, high, no factor. They have to calibrate their eyes to give uh, accurate distance calls to the deck, and that's, that's a challenge, and it changes based on what you're expecting to see. They need to happen quickly. They need to say exactly the right thing at the right time so that we know what we need to do and take uh, take that information on as like actionable information. So she'll, she'll get it down uh, during a daytime landing inside a grassy zone. And then we'll take her and we'll fly her at night and we'll put on uh, MVGs, night vision goggles on her and she'll have a 40 degree field of view looking through toilet paper tubes. And then all of that uh, distance estimation that she's worked on starts to go away. So that's part of the training that we, we work with them on. Flying the Osprey for the, for the Marine Corps has meant to me that I can be operationally employed in a very wide range of mission profiles. As we shift over to the Pacific Theater, what we're dealing with are longer transits over water without land bases for us to operate from. The Osprey is also used to provide humanitarian aid. Personally, I've done uh, hurricane relief operations in Puerto Rico. Uh, and I've been able to deliver food and water to people that have needed it. We were able to land uh, in zones, baseball fields, all across the island. The people were writing uh, help in their yards and stones and, and trash to get uh, the Ospreys to come in and land, and we were able to bring food and water and medical supplies all over the island. Today was great. It was a good flight. A lot of the future operation concepts of the Marine Corps are going to focus on the Osprey, doing more of what it does and doing it better. I'm actually applying to the Naval Academy right now because I am interested in becoming a pilot. If I get accepted, I'll have four more years in school and graduate and commission as an officer. The whole way that the Marine Corps trains is to add more assets and be able to bring a more complicated fight to the battlefield. We're just a small aspect and a small piece of it, but that's what we bring to the fight. You've probably seen this before, but this is what it's like inside a tank when it fires. Because of security concerns, the U.S. Army doesn't let outside cameras inside its tanks. But it gave us this exclusive footage of what it's like to train on the inside. These soldiers are training to be tankers in the U.S. Army. And even though the U.S. has used tanks in combat for over a century, this generation of soldiers could have a unique advantage. These two triggers are to shoot. It's like a video game controller, sir. All you need to do is just hold on to this and press fire. Video games actually helps because when you're inside, you have certain controls for operating the gun called Cadillacs, and it's basically like holding a controller. As soon as they get in that gunner station, they hold on to that, it's already familiar to them. Up, up. For a video game generation, I think they're doing great on the tanks because this is, this is what they do at home, is play with a controller. That's what a tank is. It's playing with a giant controller. Why do you like tanks? Tanks, it just run stuff over, blow stuff up all day. It's my, I mean, who wouldn't want to do that all day? This is why we're here. We're here to fire things and blow stuff up. Ever since I was little, it's just always been a dream of mine to be able to say, I work on tanks. People who like big guns and loud noises, 1,500 horsepower engines and fire, I mean, that's how it draw me in. It may seem like fun, but these soldiers find out during training there's much more to being a tanker than this. And that with the fun comes inherent danger. These things can happen to you. You can get crushed, your arms, legs, and whatever it is. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in a tank, and we try to tell them about the safety hazards. That way they can be scared of it and then respect it through fear. Inside the armor school in Fort Benning, Georgia, Army soldiers train to fight with this. The M1 Abrams Battle Tank. Nicknamed the Beast, Dracula, and Whispering Death. I mean, that is a 70-ton hunk of American steel, and it is crazy. 
to think that one of us can get behind the wheel of that thing. Hey, come on! Come on! Along with tankers, the Armor School trains cavalry scouts. Known as the eyes and ears of the battlefield, they train with grenade launchers and anti-tank weapons. Armor is basically the term that the United States military uses for when it comes to any kind of mechanized force. Our main goal is force on force with armor on armor. Scouts and tankers were the armor community. Place your weapon on platform five. All enlisted armor soldiers must complete 22 weeks of one station unit training. Put on safe, knucklehead. After 10 weeks of basic training, trainees go through 12 more weeks of advanced instruction. Go, dude. Base pay starts at about $22,000 a year. Insiders spent four days inside the armor school, where we saw different groups of soldiers at various stages of training. Once inside Fort Benning, it's about a 45-minute drive to Hastings Range, where soldiers train to drive the tank and use its weapon systems, including a 120-millimeter cannon Underway. and mounted machine guns. So what are a few things after watching the video that you guys noticed you did wrong? When I needed to uh, save the gun on the last uh, shot, I missed the handle. You gotta shoot low, see where your bursts are hitting, and then walk it up. Yes sir, yes sir. Growing up, I feel like a lot of kids play video games, they see the tanks in the games, and you know, it's everyone's dreamed of being inside of a tank. But being on top of one, being inside of one, is a completely different feeling. Uh, it was way better than I could, uh, could have imagined. It was amazing. But tanks emerged long before the era of video games, first used in combat in World War I. The U.S. Army transitioned its horse-mounted cavalry branch to a fully mechanized force in the Second World War. The lessons of World War II have taught American Army men the need for tanks, tanks and more tanks. But what we have now is the capability to take a tank on. During week one, trainees get an up-close look at the evolution of American tanks and those used by the enemy. So when that gun fired on a light aluminum vehicle, it was a religious experience because it bucked like a Bronco. After decades of evolution, one tank emerged as the Army's weapon of choice, the M1 Abrams. With a unit cost of about $9 million, it debuted in combat during the Gulf War and remains the Army's main battle tank. It's manned by a four-person crew, the tank commander, the gunner, the loader, and the driver. The driver sits at the front of the tank's hull. The other three occupy the basket attached to the tank's turret, which moves with the turret when it rotates. How does one drive a tank? It's a throttle like a four-wheeler. You're holding it, you throttle to go faster. Driving, I would say, is the easiest part of being on a tank. What was it like in there when you actually fired the round? Uh, just like a really strong gust of wind hits you. There's some dust flying. I mean, it was insane. The smell inside the tank, that smell is just you only get it inside the tank. You can never get it anywhere else. I can't explain it, sir. It's just you, you got to experience it yourself. Do you feel safe when you're inside that tank? No, sir. No? Why? Um, I don't have an answer for that, sir. Do you think because you know that anti-armor guns could all, uh, take you out as well? Is that kind of why? Or? No, sir. Okay. When they get inside that and they see everything, it's daunting. It kind of scares them because there's so much that can happen. There's so many moving parts. These things can happen to you. you can, get crushed, your arms, legs, and whatever it is. It, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in a tank and we try to tell them about the safety hazards. That way they can be scared of it and then respect it through fear. And it helps them throughout their career and understand that, hey, I know what this is gonna do to me if I'm in the way. See these little dudes, they just fall right in there, huh? Those big boys gotta like crawl in there. Before they operate the tank, 
They go over the proper procedures step by step. So the parking brake is set, correct? Yes, sir. Go ahead and disconnect that and then put it back together. All right, so we're driving around. Also, it was a fire. What's the first thing we do? Um, we turn towards the wind. We're... You ain't gonna alert nobody? You gonna start dipping out on them? No, sir. Okay, so what do we do first? They learn about the tank's features. Just like that. And its limitations. Go this way. Where's the bathroom on the Abrams? Sir, there is no bathroom on the Abrams. <laughs> there isn't a bathroom. No? No. There's no restroom in the tank. Like, everything inside the tank is meant to destroy the enemy and continue the mission and finish the mission's intent. Where's the bathroom on the Abrams? Uh, in the bottle. Yeah? It's a bottle. There's no bathroom in there. If you gotta go, you gotta go. Soldiers spend part of training in the motor pool where they learn how to maintain the tank's components and its weapons. They learn how to repair the tank's tracks and wheels using tools like sledgehammers. All right. We teach them how to do things out here to where they can troubleshoot anything out there because they already know the steps and stuff like that. Just so they know what they're doing in like a, a safe environment versus you know if we're out on the range and something were to happen, they didn't know what to do. They're going through the clear, disassemble, reassemble, load, unload, and perform a functions check on a 50 cal. It's an M2 50 caliber machine gun. It's one of the weapon systems on the tank. It's mounted on the top of the tank. They do have to be trained and proficient with it. You're proficient in every station on the tank and every weapon system in case something happens to someone on the crew. It's considered a small arms weapon, mostly because it does have the 120 millimeter main gun. The Abrams tank's 120 millimeter smoothbore gun fires a variety of rounds that can destroy other tanks up to 3,000 meters away. So this is our M865 training Sabo round. This is uh, what we use to simulate our service Sabo ammunition for training. It weighs about, uh, approximately 35 pounds. The blue aluminum pedals are discarded when it is fired. The uh, silver spike is the actual sub-projectile that goes downrange impacts with the target. The tank can hold 42 rounds total. Our service ammunition is designed to penetrate through uh, enemy armor, and then it has a devastating effect on the inside of the vehicle. Come on, come on. This one's a little bit heavier. This is the M1002 training uh, MPAT round. When a service round of this type hits a target, it will blow up on the outside of it, and it uh, forms a jet stream of copper. I'm gonna set it back down. Is it heavy? It is a little bit heavy. So How much does that one weigh? This one's about 62 pounds. They're expected to be able to load that 62 pound round in about seven seconds. The rounds aren't light. When loading, you have to be fast and efficient. How have you trained physically? A lot of push-ups. That's a movie, not a picture. Oh. <laughs> Female soldiers became eligible to train for combat arms positions in 2016. Today, about 4% of the soldiers training in the armor school are women. There are mostly male soldiers. I wasn't expecting a lot of females to be here when I first showed up. I expect the same treatment that the males get. Do you feel like you've gotten that? Yes, sir. Among soldiers training to be cavalry scouts, the percentage of women is even smaller. Only about 2%. What is a cav scout? So a cav scout is basically the, the eyes and ears of the brigade. The eyes and ears of the commander. The eyes and ears of the battlefield. The eyes and ears of the battlefield. So you're going in, and you're being sneaky and trying to figure out um, the enemy and their positions. Scouts get sent out before any other larger elements such as infantry or heavy armor. So it's basically the Cap Scouts' responsibility to make sure that an area is either clear or if that there are enemies in an area, we're relaying exactly what they're doing up the chain of command. Blank rounds are used during this training exercise. During the shooting, an instructor alerted this soldier that while he was aiming toward the enemy, his fellow soldiers were in the path of his rifle. That's bad, and that's something we got to stop right away. You get the adrenaline going, you kind of zone in on one thing, you get the blinders put on. 
In a training environment, that's absolutely when you want to do something like that so it can be corrected and fixed. I had never fired a weapon before I joined the Army, sir. Really? No, sir. No hunting or anything like that? No hunting, sir. It's definitely become more familiar and normal. It's just basically a part of the uniform at this point. Cav Scouts get hands-on experience with even more powerful weapons, like the M320 grenade launcher, which attaches to the M4 carbine, and the AT4 rocket launcher. The reason why uh, scouts are learning how to utilize this weapon system is because we would need to be able to destroy enemy armor vehicles, uh, tanks, definitely uh, a civilian vehicle would not stand a chance against this. The AT-4 is a single-use weapon. After it's fired, it can't be reloaded, and each live round costs about $2,000. That's why soldiers in training learn to aim and fire it using 9mm bullets. Loaded. Although the soldiers don't fire live rounds themselves, Instructors demonstrate what the AT-4 can really do. Clear. This is something that the soldiers look forward to. It provides them with the capability of them actually being able to destroy enemy armor vehicles. As armor soldiers, tankers and Cav Scouts are technically teammates, but there's a competition between them. I've heard that there's like a saying for Cavalry scouts, it's like... <laughs> if you ain't Cav, you ain't shit. What does that mean? You're not shit if you're not a Cav scout. Hey, brothers! If you ain't Cav, you ain't shit! There it is. But tankers tend to disagree. The scouts are just, to me, they're just jealous because they have to walk into the woods and hide there and play hide-and-go-seek on a professional level, while us tankers get to chill inside this steel beast that has AC and a heat. A Cav Scout's mission is to gather intelligence to share with their commander who may decide to send in tanks to engage the enemy. When we need the tankers, we need the tankers, and when they need us, they need us. We give each other a hard time, but we really need each other. Scouts report a section of enemy armor in your sector. Defender report. The partnership is simulated in live fire exercises. 108, at this time, battle carry stable. Prepare for a defensive engagement. Ensure you're in a defile. Report wreck on one. Target. Instructors observe and command the soldiers from a tower overlooking the range. 108 and 103, updated air and barrel follow. Thermal cameras show the targets more than 1,000 meters away. Target. I'm giving each individual tank the proper commands of what to expect, what they're going to shoot, when to move. It is my job to ensure that the tanks are identifying and engaging the proper targets. They could be deploying to Korea or Kuwait or Europe. It could be anything and we just tell them, hey, you need to be prepared mentally, financially, make sure you talk to your families and all this and just be ready for anything. As soon as you graduate, you're going to hit the ground running. It feels great knowing that I'll be able to go out and serve this country one way or another. It's a little scary knowing that I might be going away from home, but I know my family will be waiting when I get back. I never thought that I would make it this far and my battle buddies kept pushing me forward, not letting me quit, and it pays off in the end a lot. They change a lot in terms of like their discipline and their camaraderie with everybody. And you know, in day one, they don't have that. They, they've never built a brotherhood with each other. But um, at the end of the day, they know that they have to work together because that's what we do in the United States Army. Like, we have to work together because without that, like, we're nobody. Tell me about these boots here. I've never seen anything like them. During the Battle of Bulge in 1945 in Germany, and the infantry were out there in the muck, and the tankers were inside the Shermans, and the it was so cold that the boot laces of the infantry were breaking, so the tankers took the boot laces off and gave it to the infantry. We took our belts off, put it around our boots, leather straps. But most importantly though is boot laces are flammable, leather straps are not. So having the least amount of flammable items on you while inside the tank is where you want to be at. Are they comfortable? Oh, I, this, this is all I wear. I don't wear any other boots. I'll ruck in them, I, don't, I tank in them, I do everything in these boots. Hurry up! He's moving! 
These U.S. Army Sniper Corps students are participating in what's known as a ghillie wash, an event designed to test the durability of a soldier's ghillie suit. Snipers rely on their ghillie suits in combat to disguise themselves from enemies. The purpose of the ghillie suit is to achieve a blending. We use natural vegetation as well. We tie that into our suit and it helps us to blend in with whatever environment we could potentially be working in. These future snipers will take the ghillie suits made and tested in training into actual combat and will rely on them to disguise themselves from enemies. Learning how to construct and use a ghillie suit is a key component of the U.S. Army Sniper Course at Fort Benning. We give them steps and places of the body where we want to cover that helps us look like nothing. They could even know that they're looking for us. They know someone is there, but they cannot find us. Commercially made ghillie suits can cost anywhere from $200 to $400. But many students make their own. It all starts with the base layer. For many, it's one of their old uniforms or a used one they can buy for roughly $100. I just cut a bunch of pieces out of it, sewed a bunch of mesh into it for venting, and then sewed netting onto the outside of it. Netting is used to break up the sniper's silhouette and to attach natural and artificial camouflage to the suit. The most common artificial camouflage is jute, a fibrous plant-based material. You just strip it into pieces and that is the hair-looking stuff all over a ghillie suit. But just be mindful of this color, right? Unless you, if you're not in shade, that's not gonna do you any good, right? That's gonna make you stick out. Instructors inspect students' ghillie suits several times during the sniper course. We do a 360 inspection, ensuring that there are points that generally get blown out, such as the crotch of the pants, armpits, elbows, stuff like that. Those high wear and tear areas are reinforced, they're, they're sewn down, they're glued. I know you got it extended here, you might want to try to extend this some here to break up this straight line. Every student's ghillie suit isn't going to be the same. There's freedom for their imagination, their creativity to make it work. We give them left and right parameters and they fit, you know, wherever they fall in. The durability of the suits is tested during an event known as the ghillie wash, which happens in week two of the sniper course. Ooh. The purpose of the ghillie wash is to season and condition their uh, ghillie suit, not only to help it soak up color and to have it kind of more natural and earthy, it also allows us to find any weak points they could potentially have in their ghillie suits. Just kind of see how, it, if it, anything will tear, like the netting and stuff on the back. The ghillie wash starts with students crawling and rolling across various terrains, including gravel, pavement, and sand. What is the primary role of cycling? We soak them down, get them wet. That's going to start creating a lot of weight. It's going to make it a little bit harder for them as well. One Exercises such as lunges, squats, and push-ups test the suit's ability to stretch under pressure. They're just kind of testing out their ghillie suit in sense of how able was it to take the beating. After roughing up their suits, students crawl on their stomachs and backs through wet and muddy trenches to add color to them. It's not necessarily we're trying to find a weak point at that point, but we're trying to get that color deeply rooted in the fabric. There is really, really deep clay mud that's pretty prominent here, so it's a, it's a good source for uh, when you're trying to get that earthy tone here. The clay around here in Georgia tastes pretty good, so. <laughs> the last section of the ghillie wash takes place in a 200-foot long trench filled with water reaching up to chest high. have them low crawling over any kind of like obstacles and stuff like that, see if the area that they drag themselves on will possibly peel up 
And again, any kind of stitching is going to rip. After climbing out of the trench, the students get hosed off to remove any excess mud before hanging their suits out to dry. It is a very physical event, but it's completely necessary. Like we have to test out these ghillie suits to make sure they're gonna withstand the test of time. The culminating test of the ghillie suits comes during stalk events. Students must navigate through wooded terrain without being spotted by the instructors walking around them or by those observing from afar with binoculars. Before the event begins, the class covers themselves in natural vegetation that matches their surroundings. On their ghillie suits, they have a number of tie downs on their, the hat, the top, and the pants. They'll tie natural vegetation that matches the environment they're currently in, uh, just to give them an initial base layer of camouflage as they move through the lane. Students are taught to use a 30 to 70 ratio of artificial to natural camouflage and must carefully pick which kinds of foliage to use. Here in Georgia, it's so hot and humid, everything dies kind of quickly. The only thing that's going to really live on you a long time is the pine leaves and stuff. And the smaller, the shorter the, leaf, the uh, plant is, the longer it'll live. Once the class enters the woods, they must keep a low profile moving slowly and deliberately to avoid drawing the eye of an instructor. As the foliage around them changes, the students swap out the natural vegetation on their ghillie suits to match their environment. But even the smallest of imperfections in a student's camouflage will get them spotted. He is and then spotter, spotting scope. Not a bad position at all, right? Uh, if you would have vegged more on that spotting scope, you guys probably would have been all right. I had like a screen over the top of my tripod, and uh, it was like an off color for the foliage that was around. I mean, you're not going to go out there and not learn something. So it's, it's definitely fun. You don't put it on, it just disappears. It's not like the movies or a video game, but you, uh, you put it on, and it helps us to achieve a blending effect with our environment. A well-constructed and properly maintained ghillie suit can last a sniper's entire career. I've done multiple washes in my ghillie suit and I've had it the entirety of me being a sniper. The only time I have to do anything to it is just replace jute because it's natural and it's going to wear away eventually. But all the stitching, everything like that is continuously held up over the years. That's the beauty of a ghillie suit is that it can be manipulated in so many different ways to kind of tailor it to whatever environment you're in. Most of these dogs are very strong. Uh, they will rip flesh, and some have strong enough mouths that they can break bones. This military working dog in training is practicing controlled aggression. In a matter of months, they'll be ready to be deployed to one of the many U.S. military bases across the globe. But before they were powerful enough to bring down a full-grown human, they started out like every other dog does. It's kind of remarkable to say that there's any aspect of public security or national defense that relies on animals, but it's the truth. There are about 1,600 military working dogs currently serving oh, like across sniff. every branch one. of the United States military. Up, 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 up. And they all started here at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Insider spent two days with the 341st Training Squadron, observing both dogs and handlers at various stages of training. Stay. Pinpoint. However many we produce, it seems like we, we, we can never get military working dogs out fast enough to meet the demands of the Department of Defense because they're just such a vital asset to everything we do. Several hundred dogs are in training at any given time, which takes about 120 days to complete. 
and is split into two blocks, detection training and patrol training. <laughs> Patrol training is teaching a dog how to essentially chase after a suspect that we're trying to apprehend who is uncooperative and controlling that dog and their aggression. So it's a non-lethal or less than lethal option for military members that defend installations or secure installations to use and apprehend suspects. Done. Good. But before they learn to chase down a suspect, the dogs have to perfect their obedience training. Good, yes. We want to have a good foundation in obedience because Down. those commanded positions, good. the sits and the downs, they need to have those uh, proficient before we can start asking for this in a higher level of stimulus. So if I were to just tell her, sit, she's not there yet. Sit, and I give her that, she's able to do it. Yes. <laughs> so the way that we teach them is that they all do it in anticipation of a reward. We give, we use marker training where we end up saying yes when we can mark whatever behavior we want at the precise times. So this is Greta and she's a sweetheart. She looks like an old lady. She's not old, I promise you. I've been working with her maybe for about two weeks now. So far right now I've been working stability with her where she's able to maintain position whenever I walk out to end a leash. Down. Good girl. And then the part that I've been working recently, sit. Good. Is getting her to sit from the down. Yes. Up. The dogs are also taught how to conquer the obstacle course or confidence course. Crawl. You. The general purpose is just getting them comfortable with going over certain obstacles. So. To simulate stuff when these guys go and work for police departments, like we have one of the obstacles that simulates a window, narrow areas going upstairs or over some sort of barrier to go and chase down a suspect. Once the dogs have a solid foundation in obedience training, they're ready to move on to the controlled aggression phase of patrol training. Isaac, out! Good, sit. Teaching a dog to show aggression, especially when it's on demand, it starts with this dog's breeding, this dog's background, coming from parents for generations that were bred to be this type of dog. The Department of Defense uses breeds like Belgian Malinois, Dutch Shepherds, and German Shepherds that are between one and three years old. We're looking for a well-balanced, environmentally sound dog that does not have issues for fearfulness or timidity. We're looking for a strong, confident dog that also likes to use its nose for hunting. We're looking for a confident bulldog that's willing to bite and defend its handler if need be. Roughly 400 dogs are purchased for the program every year, mainly from Europe. The rest come from the department's breeding program at Lackland. We started the program in 1998. It's basically a contingency plan. The idea is that since we obtain the vast majority of our dogs overseas, something might happen to interrupt our supply of military working dogs. So in 1998, we began this uh, sm rather small-scale breeding program to establish an organic ability on our own to breed and develop military working dogs. The program rears the puppies until they're six weeks old, at which point they're fostered out to homes in the local community until they're seven months old. Seven months is the first age at which I can apply a test to the puppies and determine whether or not they are good material as military working dogs, they're, that their behavior expressed at that time predicts how they're gonna behave as adults. <laughs> Puppies that meet the program's standards are brought back to Lackland to prepare for the military working dog course. This is what we would call the beginning stages of controlled aggression, where our dogs are taught how to apprehend people. A lot of it's instinctual. It's based mainly on prey drive. A dog's natural instinct is to chase and, and grab stuff. Uh, so we play off of, off of their drives. The puppies are tested one final time when they reach one year old. 
30 to 50 ultimately enter the military working dog course every year, where they'll continue to build on skills like controlled aggression. What we're training for is the situation where a military working dog handler in the field would have to apprehend a suspect using a military working dog. What we train, we call it the six phases. And initially we do the field interview, which is when someone approaches the dog and it shows that the dog can be stable, maintain position, and you know not attack just any random person that comes up to talk to you. And then we move into the running bite or the pursuit and attack. So this is a bite sleeve. Basically, it's just a tool that we use to teach the dogs how to bite a target area, i.e. the arm. This sleeve has a little bit of leather and some foam on the inside. And then on the outside, like the burlaps to cover it. So these ones provide a lot of protection. This, this one, you really don't feel much they're biting more of the material than your actually arm. If you feel anything, it's more just a slight pressure. Most of these dogs are very strong. Uh, they will rip flesh. <laughs> um, and some have strong enough mouths that they can break bones. Obviously, if you're running and the dog is chasing after you at full speed and jumps up, grabs a hold of the arm, takes you to the ground, there is a whole lot of other injuries that may come along with that. But any of those options, I would argue, are still better than lethal force or even some other less than lethal options that we have to offer. Isaac, out, sit! The dogs are also trained to stand down from an attack if they're called off by their handler. Good, sit. The capping of the, that drive is the hardest part because you're putting their favorite thing in the world and you're saying, don't touch this. Finally, the dogs are trained to maintain position while their handler pats down the suspect. They be ready to attack if the suspect makes any sudden or aggressive movements. When the dog is coming at me, I definitely feel an adrenaline rush. I've done a lot of like extreme sports and I would definitely say catching dogs is when my adrenaline is at an all-time high. You know the field! Find him. Patrol training also includes scouting exercises, where dogs are taught to search for a suspect, both in a building and in the woods. What you got, mama? The way that odor works is if he's the source right there, the way the scent will come out is kind of like a giant cone. So you'll start to see the dogs bracket get big to smaller to smaller to smaller to smaller. Then she gets, boom, source. And from there, it's on us to say, hey, you found him. Give that challenge and also give the suspect the last chance to give up, per se. If not, we send the dog in. You're the fifth. Come out, Mercy, my dog. Get him. Oh. The dog's ability to search for and locate a scent out in the field is honed during the first block of their training. Yes. Which is focused on detection. Using training aids filled with trace elements of explosive materials or narcotics, the dogs are trained to detect an array of odors. Trainers utilize classical conditioning to hone each dog's natural detection capabilities. The dogs we observed were between one and two years old. It's all about pairing an odor with a reward system. So the dog relates this reward with that odor. And of course, to do that, the dog has to have value for the reward. So no matter what, if it thinks I'm hiding that ball, it's gonna search and search and search until it finds that ball. And it's just pairing of the odor on top of that. Through repetition, the dogs learn that finding a source of odor means they'll get rewarded with their toy. Once a dog forms that association between the odor and their toy, they're ready to move on to the next step in their training. This room is filled with boxes containing either nothing, a novelty odor, or the odor the dogs are trained to find.
but at its basic form, uh, order it dissipates. So the dog is picking it up at its weakest area and it's following it to its strongest point. And then they're going to bracket it back and forth and follow where odor is until they finally get to the source. When the dog finds the source of the odor, they're trained to give a final response, going into a sit or down position. Eventually, they're going to have to work as a team with their handler, and then the handler is going to have to see that change of behavior. So if the dog were to move, it's going to be harder for the handler to make that determination that odor is actually there. Once the dogs are proficient in searching for odors in the box room, they move on to larger environments, including vehicle parking lots and warehouses. Bronco. Check. Our voices are one of the most important things that we can utilize in order to persuade, ask, or tell the dog what it is that we need them to do. When we first make a presentation on order, we're trying to kind of ask the dog to come there. So, hey, check here, check here, look here. Kind of that pitch of, it's fun, it's exciting, come to me, it's gonna be more fun. Hey. Check. And then after that, if they're still not coming towards us, then we start kind of using more of that command voice that, hey, check, check right here, up here, look here. Bronco, check. So that's mainly those voices, and it's just something that with experience, it gets more and more fine-tuned to be that much more meaningful to the dog. Handlers are trained to look out for any behavioral changes in their dog that could indicate they've picked up on a scent. Aggressive response. His change of behavior, he'll do kind of like a head snap. Whenever he picks up odor, he'll snap his head. And he's very sporadic, typically running around very hyper, but he gets a little more focused when he gets on odor. Yes. Each dog learns differently just as each person has their own personality. Each dog has their own personality and uh, just as if you were trying to teach uh, school age children or high school or even at the college level, each person's going to have something that they need different to understand the task. I think maybe the, the most common misconception is that a lot of these dogs do it because they're excited about doing it. It's to them, they get excited about work. A lot of people think that these dogs are very aggressive, and while that does happen, we do get some aggressive dogs, a lot of them are very friendly, <laughs> and they do want to play with their handlers, and they're just normal dogs at the end of the day who want attention and care and all the things that a dog would normally want from a human being. They just understand that they've been taught certain behaviors that are play to them. Once the dogs complete their training, they're evaluated in their detection and patrol capabilities. Roughly 90% of the dogs that enter the program will graduate and be deployed to one of the many U.S. military bases around the world. There's a, a huge sense of mission accomplishment and pride when these dogs get out. I mean, we're out here very early in the morning and sometimes super late in the afternoon. And when you finally get to see these dogs qualify and you know that they're going to go out to a handler in the field and you know go on to a bigger mission there's there's a huge sense of pride there get off my desk now get off my desk now what do they what do they this division of US Navy recruits is in week 3 of their 10 week boot camp get them up Holcomb. it's supposed to hurt Down. They're enduring what's known as an intensive training exercise, or ITE session. Push-ups, get there. It lasts for about 40 minutes without a break. Up position. I told you yesterday I was going to get mine. Y'all been pissing me off for a fucking week. Between not working together, thinking it's just a joke, and it's not. You arguing, not wanting to step up to lead. You either lead or you follow. That's simple. Stop with this individuality shit and work as a team. It takes everyone a little bit, I think, to realize the big message. We are one family, we are one team. There are no more individuals. IT is not fun. It's to help you remember what you did wrong so that you don't do it again. We had enough? Yes, yes sir. Sir. No the fuck we have it. This is Navy Boot Camp. Every year, more than 40,000 recruits graduate before becoming sailors and officially joining the fleet. It happens here at Recruit Training Command Great Lakes, located about 35 miles north of Chicago. RTC Great Lakes is the only boot camp for enlisted U.S. Navy sailors. Who's going to a submarine? Yeah. Why? 
<laughs> More money? More money? Absolutely, 100%. Base pay for enlisted sailors is about $22,000 a year. Sailors commit to actively serve for at least four to six years, depending on their specialty or rate. There is no special skills required prior to signing that commitment. We were able to take any civilian off the street and transform them into a smartly disciplined, physically fit, basically trained sailor. Boot camp begins with the night of arrival. Let's go! Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Buses driving from O'Hare Airport bring about 100 new recruits to the recruit in processing facility. Let's go! We want to put them in a stressful environment to, to show them that even though it might be stressful for them, they can get through it. You're moving too slow! And then it kind of like sets the tone for the rest of training. What the fuck are you looking at, guy? Where did I tell you to look? Where? Where did I tell you to look? Welcome to Recruit Training Command. I'm Chief Walters. I'll be one of your facilitators this evening. When I tell you to, you will remove your cell phone. You're going to call home. Call your parents. Call your recruiter. I don't care who. But you're going to let them know that you arrived here safely. You have one minute. Go. What up, man? Hey, I just made it in. Um, I don't have long to speak, but I just want to tell you that I made it safely, but I'm okay. You got 45 seconds. I'll get through it. I gotta go, Mom. I called my mom. It was definitely emotional, though, because you kind of know that's the last time you're gonna be able to contact your family for a little bit. Love you very much. <laughs> you guys have a good one. Bye. Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? Yeah. What are you saying? Yep. It's yes, G. What is your problem, guy? What is your fucking problem? Why are you moving so slow? You're on my time now, not your time. Hurry up! It was brutal, I won't lie. It was a uh, culture shock. You are learning pretty much how to be a new human. You do not know what the fuck you're supposed to be doing at any given time. You will stand in attention until told to do otherwise. At no point in time will you look a staff member in the eyes. That's fucking rude and disrespectful and that's the quickest way to piss us off. Is that understood? Yes, Chief! How about some fucking motivation? Is that understood? Yes, Chief! Recruits receive their ditty bags. Hey, hurry up. Let's go. Get your socks off my table. Let's go. Which hold their different uniforms, hygiene products, and basic items they'll need for boot camp. Hurry up. Go, 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 go. Recruits must provide urine samples to make sure they have no drugs in their systems. Those who can't immediately provide a sample are ordered to hydrate until they can. Although male and female recruits sleep in different compartments, some train in gender-integrated divisions. After being assigned to divisions, recruits wait to meet their Recruit Division Commanders, or RDCs. Get the fuck up! Let's go! Turn around! Back the fuck up! Signified by their red shoulder cords, these RDCs will be with the division until they graduate from boot camp. Did we say you could talk? They want to be here to be sailors. So that's our job, to train them, to help them get there. Why are we so goddamn slow? Hey, you, isn't he taller than you? Yes, chief, no chief, I chief. We're not their friends. We're here to make them sailors. Why are you looking at recruit? Do I owe you anything? You want them to be uncomfortable, right? You want to get them out of their comfort zone. Boot camp is hard, but when you go out to the fleet, if you make a mistake, you're going to kill somebody, right? Now it's lives are at stake. So we want them to understand that, that the bigger picture. Male recruits have to shave their heads. Female recruits can pull their hair back in a bun or wear it down as long as it does not extend below the back of the collar. The new recruits pay their first visit to the galley, where they eat in silence and stare straight ahead until they're dismissed. Table eight, get up and get out! They'll need their strength for their first test of boot camp. Come on, push it up. An initial physical assessment known as the pacer test. Everyone up. Timed intervals of push-ups, planks, oh, and running. Not every recruit shows up where they need to be. That's okay. That's what we're here for. Put your hands by your side. Look at everybody else next to you. Fix yourself. 
if we identify individuals that are struggling, then we can curtail the training to make sure everyone's on a level play playing field to be successful. Two minutes on the left. Recruits have two chances to pass the test. Two, two, six. If they fail, they're recycled into another division where they'll keep trying until they can move forward. In week one, recruits are tested on their ability to swim. Step. God forbid you're in that abandoned ship scenario where you do have to leave the safety of your ship. The Navy has deemed that we need to be able to implement a swim qualification to ensure your safety and the safety of your shipmates. Everyone in the Navy has to have a third class swim qualification. The third class qualification consists of stepping from an elevated platform. Servicing unassisted, swimming 50 yards, then doing a five minute prone on your front, known as a prone float, or on your back, known as a supine float. I knew it's the Navy, you're gonna need to know how to swim a little bit. I had swam before, but I had never jumped off a diving board. <laughs> Hitting the water, you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that, it's a shock. But not all recruits are ready to take the leap. Some have to be pulled from the water during the test and sent to remedial swimming, where they learn the basics of being comfortable in the water. We're just asking you to try to actually calm yourself down and realize that the water is not going to drag you under. You know, you have to cooperate with it. We have a 99.97% pass rate. Uh, we have a higher pass rate for recruits that can't swim than the Navy has of making civilians into sailors. During week three, recruits report to the Marlin Spike trainer where they get their first taste of what it's like to be aboard a Navy ship. Hand over hand, positive control. Y'all literally just did this. What is the problem? Figure eight, one figure eight at a time. Once they do get to us, there's that nervousness. They don't know anything about a ship. It's scary. It's a big old vessel in the water, right? Remove the bird's nest. We teach them about how to communicate on a ship, how to tie a knot, transitioning them to be a sailor. This walkthrough, that was the easy part. Now the pressure's on. You fuck up, you fuck up. Each recruit is assigned a role that corresponds to a real member of a ship's crew. Make all preparations for getting underway. With the objectives of getting a ship underway and bringing it safely into port. Make all preparations for entering port. Hey! So at the bridge at the very top, you have the boatswain's mate, and then we have our bridge phone talker. Lines three and four. Singled up, bridge eye. They're gonna be having comms with the other three phone talking stations down on the actual ship. Attention on deck, attention on pier. And the, the petty officers in charge relay that message to the line captain. Fake down line going inboard. Fake down line going inboard. The line captains have that script saying, single up all lines, take in all lines. Double up all lines, high. Who the fuck is talking? It's loud, it's chaotic, it's hectic. Do because when they're on the actual ship, when they have actual waves moving that ship, they need to be calm, cool, and collected and resort back to their training. When I say prepare heaving line for heaving, that's when he comes over here. So you're gonna hold this so he can tie the knot. Right. It's all about communication as well as following all the safety precautions. Anything that can get you injured, you need to make sure you're aware of what that is, make sure your teammates aren't doing it either. Watch your feet, watch your feet, watch your feet. Just standing there, they can be injured. Somebody can go overboard. Somebody can trip up on a line. Take it for myself because I've, I've eaten complete crap before, like falling on the deck of a ship, and it was not fun. One, two, three. Remove figure eights in round turn. Take figure eights off and then round turn. Move to safety zone. But seamanship starts in the classroom. What's a vast mean? Stop. Stop. Okay, next. What's next? Single up all lines. Folks will aye. Aye. All stations, single up all lines. All stations, bridge. All stations, bridge, single up all lines. Single up all, mm. uh, oh. single up all lines. It's like speaking a different language. You got to get the hang of it. It helps that everyone else is doing it with you. So the more you hear it, it's all around you. Eventually, you won't even think about it. Just tell him the message. Bridge, single up all lines. It's Barney style. We we break it down Barney style. Barney um, like the dinosaur. Yes, pretty much. Single up all lines, on. Perfect, just like that. This is called the confidence chamber. I don't call it the gas chamber. I don't call it the torture chamber. It's none of that stuff. It is the confidence chamber. The reason you go through this is so we can prove to you that the mask works. Does that make sense? Yes, Chief!
In week four, recruits are exposed to CS gas or tear gas in the confidence chamber. Who's nervous right now? Somebody tell me why you're nervous. I'm nervous about how my body's gonna react. Body's gonna react? It's gonna react accordingly. After learning how to properly don and clear the masks, the recruits head inside the chamber and wait for their turn to step to the line at the front of the room. An instructor pours the powder inside the CS capsules onto a hot plate, filling the room with gas. Mask up, come up, let's go! Get that mask up! Get that mask up! When they take off the mask, it only takes a few seconds before they feel the effects of the gas. <coughs> Some recruits don't seem affected by it, <laughs> but most struggle. They cup their hands under their chins to prevent bodily fluids from leaking onto the floor. <coughs> what does it feel like when you take that mask off? It hurts, burns a lot. It's a good sinus clearer if you're sick. You'll be able to breathe once you leave there. Sierra Kurt Morales, Division 205, hoo-yah! Sierra Kurt Morales, Division 205, hoo-yah! Recruits say their names and division numbers, followed by a hoo-yah. Hoo Let's go, go! After about 15 seconds of exposure, they're allowed to exit the chamber. Keep moving! It definitely wasn't fun, definitely wouldn't, you know, sign up to do it again, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Who yeah, is it, eh? Yo, man, where y'all at? Where my man yoman at? Man yoman? <laughs> Later in week four, recruits are trained to fight fires. You never know when a simple fire will break out on board the ship. <laughs> Any sailor needs to be ready to combat that fire to save the ship, aircraft, submarine, you name it. Controlled fires fueled by propane tanks simulate different types of fires that could occur on a ship. A lot of them don't understand that pressure that comes through the hose. As soon as you open up that nozzle, all that pressure starts to push you backwards. They kind of hold it nonchalantly a little bit. It was one of the most hands-on experiences we got to do. Part of the teamwork that helps you realize that there's going to be points where your life is going to be in the hands of another person. It's important to pay attention because if you're not doing things correctly, you're putting someone else in danger. Recruits trained to safely fire the M9 Beretta pistol as well as to assemble and disassemble it. A lot of people that come through here have minimal to zero experience. If something's incorrect, we, we fix it right away. If we see that some of them are kind of just a little bit too nervous, we'll talk to them, make sure that they're mentally okay, and make sure that they feel safe and they feel like they're in a good environment. Why should Navy sailors need to be qualified to shoot weapons? I would say most typically on watch, that's when we have to stand watch and provide some sort of security. If someone steps on board a vessel, anything seems kind of weird, um, kind of sketchy, then we would have to employ that weapon if things start to escalate. Boot camp culminates with an event known as battle stations. It happens inside this building which may not look like much from the outside, but inside, the recruits encounter this. The USS Trayer. It's a two-thirds scale replica of a Navy destroyer ship designed and built by companies that created attractions for Walt Disney World. Good evening, Division. Battle Stations is an accumulation of every training evolution you've done throughout BASIC mixed with a little bit of sleep deprivation. <laughs> so I think it's the closest thing any of us are gonna get to what being on a ship's like. Although the Navy agreed to let our crew film parts of the Battle Stations event, we weren't allowed to show major details of the scenarios or solutions to the problems recruits have to solve. So it goes over 17 different scenarios from firefighting to seamanship, first aid. So all of those combined into one special night. A special and long night. Recruits are not allowed to sleep during the event. Doors go. Who are you telling? I do not are care. you telling me? Are you telling Petty Officer? Are you telling you 
your CLS. Tell the CLS. Don't risk go CLS. When they say when you get the fleet, you gotta be able to handle sleep deprivation, you really do. You have to be able to handle doing the right thing even when it's very stressful, even when you're cold, wet, tired, sleepy, and even when your peers may not be in the right mindset either. The first scenario we saw involved a burst water pipe in a room full of ammunition shells that recruits had to move while trying to patch the pipe. If you can't do it alone, ask for help. They use their firefighting skills to put out a fire that breaks out on board. We have all the sound effects, the lighting, the smoke, just because we want to make sure it's as realistic as possible. Uh, once you go out to the ship, if there is ever, you know, emergency situation that happened, we want to kind of reflect that here. We were allowed to film inside one of the training areas built to resemble the damage suffered by the USS Cole in the deadly attack in October of 2000, with details down to the clock on the wall, which is stopped on the minute the real attack occurred. But when the scenario starts, recruits don't notice such details. People are dying! People are dying! They have to locate and evacuate a casualty through thick smoke, over obstacles, and in total darkness. Some people like working under stress because they say pressure either produces diamonds or it bursts pipes. It was really fun. I would definitely do it again, maybe after a full night's rest, but I would 100% do battle stations again. It's a night I will never forget. After battle stations is complete, recruits line up in front of the USS Trayer to receive their Navy ball cap, symbolizing their transition from recruits to Navy sailors. They realize everything that they have done thus far, all the, the blood, sweat, and tears they shed, they finally earned their Navy ball cap, and it's a proud moment for all of them. That morning was extremely emotional. I was definitely more proud of that than anything I've ever done before. Nothing compares to that moment. Friends and family gather to witness their new sailors graduate before joining the fleet. You see the change. You have some recruits that you never thought they were gonna make it past training. But once they graduate and you see that, wow, they grasp the point of this, you know they're gonna be out there, out in the fleet. It's really rewarding. Seeing recruits come off the bus with long hair, not knowing their left to the right, not knowing how to wear a uniform, and seeing that transition that they make from a civilian to a recruit to a sailor is truly eye-watering and truly a blessing. These U.S. Army Sniper Corps students are participating in a stalk mission where they have to stealthily navigate through wooded terrain without being spotted by instructors. It's designed to prepare future snipers for real missions they'll encounter on deployment. So the way we have kind of molded the stock portion of the course now is to kind of more closely mirror a real world mission. A well, sniper's secondary mission is to collect and report battlefield information, but nine times out of 10, that's the mission you're gonna end up doing. Students at the sniper course perform four practical stock exercises before moving on to graded events of which they'll have three opportunities to pass or be dropped from the course. 
By the time we get to the end of graded stocks, we, we'll generally lose between five and eight students. On a brisk morning in October, Insider followed a class participating in their first practical stalk exercise. Your team will be given 10 minutes to prepare yourself and equipment for this exercise. From this point on, you're only authorized to talk amongst your team and two instructors. Running is not authorized. Failure to perform proper movement techniques will result in your team being reset. Being reset more than once for any reason is an automatic failure. The class covers their ghillie suits with natural vegetation to match their environment. In order to truly blend in with your environment, to get rid of the human signatures of the sides of the head, shoulders, the areas that are distinguishable, you have to tie in vegetation to your foreground, background, everything around you. Students use hair ties and 550 cord that they've glued onto their ghillie suits to affix the foliage and are taught to use a 70 to 30 ratio of natural to artificial camouflage. Here in Georgia, it's so hot and humid, everything dies kind of quickly. The only thing that's gonna really live on you a long time is the pine leaves and stuff. And the smaller, the shorter the plant is, the longer it'll live. I like to work from the top down. As many tie downs as you can have on your ghillie suit is better. I feel like the initial veg was good and it was, it was easy to cover it in like dead grass and trees that are around you. The students carry the gear that they would have with them during a real mission, including an M2010 enhanced sniper rifle, tripods, a spotting scope, and navigational tools. After plotting a course to their destination, the students head off into the woods in teams of two. Although snipers are prepared to work alone, working in teams can increase security and effectiveness. The days of a single sniper crawling out of their base camp and, and going on a mission are over. So in real life, they're gonna be at least in a team of two, more than likely a team of three. So here at Sniper School, in an attempt to modernize, we pair them up in teams. Once the exercise begins, they have two hours to reach a spot from which they can view their target, which in this case is a truck. Students are taught several movement techniques to use while stalking, including the sniper low crawl, hands and knees crawl, and crouch walk, and will get docked points if the walkers moving amongst them spot them moving improperly. Freeze, you two. So if a team is trying to rush up to the objective, like not moving tactically or in the movement techniques that would, they have been previously taught, then one of the instructors on the lane will stop them, gather their information, and send them back, uh, usually a terrain feature, away, and have them restart after explaining what they did wrong. Yeah, Roger, it's probably this guy right here that I got my flag on. He was uh, facing away from the truck, so it's probably his back that you saw. All right, so you guys tracking, right? Yeah, we had movement. Yo, so, thick is good. Yeah. Right, getting in that thick spot is good, but you're playing a dangerous game, right? Because you're mixing the potential of overhead movement. And look how close you guys are to the objective. You are way too close to be causing this much movement. Halfway through, when we were doing a map check, we stood straight up and down instead of taking a knee, which is our, our fault for that. But they just told us initially, like, have that low profile the whole time. And uh, it's, you have to have that in the back of your head, which is kind of hard when you're carrying a bunch of stuff. Instructors will also dock points for improper camouflage. What do you think you look like right now walking through the woods? Stupid dude with a... A dude in a ghillie suit. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, take your time right now, fix yourself before you hit that next screen feature. If you were wandering around the lane and you had taken off your, your ghillie hat and you were just walking around bareheaded, improper camouflage. So we're going to stop you, correct you during these practical exercises, send you back so you can try again. The walker is really a friend. If we see a team that's making some mistakes and maybe needs to do some things better, they're more than welcome to ask questions. They can ask uh, any of the walkers on the lane, how should I do this? And we'll give them tips. Shine and shadow, man, are gonna get you every time. Okay, so take it out of the equation and then just worry about contrast. Cool, head back to work. Even if teams evade detection by the walkers, they can also get spotted by the instructors scanning for them with binoculars. So if they think they see some movement, like for instance, if they were to rub up against the sapling, it would make the sapling wave back and forth. 
So that's a target indicator. So that would key the observer in on that area. There's two techniques he can use. He can either call up one of the walkers and just walk him that way and try to walk him into that team. Or he can call freeze, which freezes the entire lane. Hey, right behind you, can you all freeze? Freeze! At that point, he would walk the walker in and try to get within 12 inches. If he gets within 12 inches and the observer calls sniper at your feet and that team is within 12 inches or any piece of their equipment, well, they're busted at that point. When a team finds a spot where they can both view the truck from behind cover, they set up their final firing position. The students swap out the vegetation on their ghillie suits and gear to match their new environment. Each member of the sniper team has an assigned role and responsibilities. So the shooter is going to be getting his weapon oriented on the target, collecting any data he can, building up his position. The spotter will be setting up his spotting scope. In a real world, he would be executing a sketch or taking uh, camera shots of the objective area, getting the environmental data, the weather data, which affects a shot depending on the range. So there's a number of little subtasks that go into each major task where the sniper is just going to shoot and the spotter is the team leader. Once they've established their final firing position, each team has to observe and record a scenario occurring at the objective. In this case, it involved two instructors setting up and firing a mortar round. The spotter must formulate a call for fire request based on what they've seen. They'll fill in the grid to the target that they're calling the artillery on. They'll give a distance and a direction and a description. So being able to see that entire scenario and the entire objective area plays into that because they need to be able to accurately describe the scenario and uh, what the target is they're going to be calling that mission in on. To prove that they're able to view enough of their target, both the shooter and the spotter have to correctly identify two letters held up by the instructors in the back of the truck. Letters up. Say again. Foxtrot. Shooter identifies Foxtrot. Good idea. Good idea. Shooter eyes down, spotter eyes up. And the letter is up. Letter's up. Papa. Papa? Papa. Spotter identifies Papa. Bad ID. Bravo. Bad ID. Letter was Bravo. Finally, to pass the exercise, the team must evade detection from the instructors scanning for them from the back of the truck. Cool, you within 10? But even the smallest of indicators will give them away. Flag, here's the shooter's head. He is prone, and then spotter, spotting scope. Not a bad position at all, right? Uh, if you would have vegged more on that spotting scope, you guys probably have been all right. They're really good at spotting movement and things that are different from the baseline around our environment. So I feel like it was really, it was kind of a shock to everyone how easily they could spot us. It was a good position. You guys had observation, right? Refine your camouflage. Okay, refine camouflaging techniques. All right, find your spot. Make sure you can see and then start vegging, right? Mm -hmm. Veg 10 times, shoot once. At the end of this stalk exercise, None of the participating students received a passing grade. I set up the spotting scope and just kind of watched the cadre for like an hour and 20 minutes um, while my partner was trying to find a place to put the rifle so he could watch them too. And we never even ended up finding a way for both of us to be able to see them from the same place. And it's hard. They make it hard for sure. <laughs> The problem is uh, the instructors that work here currently, they, they have a lot of experience, both real world and here at the schoolhouse. You definitely have to, have to think outside the box if you're, if you're going to get a passing score, especially in your first exercise. This class will have three more practical stalk exercises to refine their skills before moving on to their graded missions. It's tough. It's tough. They changed it recently. I don't know anybody here that's trained to do buddy team stalks on an objective like that, so... It's difficult, but it's doable. The skills students learn during stalk missions are directly applicable to their future careers as snipers. 
you're always collecting and reporting battlefield information, you're only sometimes going to end up putting a round down range. Since that is the greater magnitude of the things that a sniper is going to be doing and what a commander is going to want from his sniper, he wants information. So we're, we're kind of gearing this portion of the course to, to build their techniques up in that and boost their confidence in their own abilities and then when they get back to their unit, they're bringing a, a real force multiplier to their commander. Relax, man. This is day one for new Army infantry soldiers. Hey, if you're in formation, I should be the only one talking. Their 22-week training begins with an event known as the first 100 yards. Come on, first! Where different platoons compete in events that test them mentally and physically. The entire intent behind it is that they understand that the Army is all about teamwork. Winning matters, and it sets that tone for the rest of their 22-week cycle here at Fort Benning. Yeah! The winning platoon receives a reward, and the losers face consequences. We need the pallet! We need the pallet! It may seem intense, but it's markedly different from what day one used to look like. Why are you switching back? Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut the hell up! Why are you switching back? In February of 2020, Insider got a look at what used to happen on day one. Get your bags up! An Get event known up. as the shark attack. You're a tough guy. Don't move. Do something. Do something. That's what I thought. An unofficial tradition born in the Vietnam era when soldiers were drafted to serve in the army. It was a very different army. You had guys coming from prison and the drill sergeants needed, they needed to assert that dominance. Why are you what we know now is that there's no reason to, you know, put somebody through that. Shut your mouth. That's why we went away from the shark attack. The Army officially replaced the shark attack in the fall of 2020. Get off, get off, let's go! Get off! Let's go! Insider returned to Fort Benning to see the first 100 yards in action. As far as it being easier, that's not the case. Straight to the front. The physical stress is still there. The mental stress is still there. We're not moving at the position of attention. And the drill sergeants bring the intensity. Yes, drill sergeant. Divided into four platoons, the all-male Delta Company of the First Battalion, 50th Infantry Regiment, forms up to begin the event. Upon the completion of your training, you'll be inducted into the Brotherhood of the Infantry that has fought and defended. Our nation's freedom for the last 246 years. Your mission, complete four collective tasks as quickly, accurately, and violently as possible. Completing the mission by closing with and destroying the enemy during the last 100 yards yields victory. In combat, there's no prize for second place. So today, only women will be rewarded. We followed 2nd Platoon, signified by red jerseys. After a short run, the platoon encounters a mass of supplies arranged in a very specific way. You three, look. We can look remember at how this is set up? Do you remember? You guys have 10 more seconds. Pay attention. How is it set up? It's gonna pay dividends later, man. With about 30 seconds to memorize the configuration of supplies, they'll be expected to recreate it later. Everybody will carry something at least once, understood? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go! Hey, let's go, man! Let's go! We gotta move! Hey, man! Let's rock! The trainees have to move the supplies while avoiding obstacles on their path to the AO or area of operations. Hey, watch the line. This scenario that we create for it is that you're conducting a resupply mission, but the goal is to get everybody to 
work together to accomplish that mission. Hey, watch these trees! Watch the trees! Hey, watch this log! Just drop the gear! Rearranging the supplies as they initially found them comes later, after a series of events that will give them plenty of time to forget. More ranks! Four ranks! Four ranks! ranks! How many of you guys actually read that study guide? Raise your hand. The trainees are quizzed on facts included in a study guide issued to them upon arrival at Fort Benning. Me and the commander will tally up total points, and that will be the winners of this next event. Who is your battalion command sergeant major and battalion commander? Talk it over, what? take your time, do it right the first time so you don't do it again. The brigade commander, what's Who's his name? The brigade commander. And rank. Just write something down. Let's go, man. Run, run. Run, 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 run. run, run. Get the it gives you a little bit of insight for the drill sergeants as to what kind of guys you're going to have and maybe where you need to focus on as far as the development of the trainees. First, where's your answers? You got If you don't fight to the front, man, you ain't going to be winners. All right, man, go to the backs of your ranks. All right, hurry up. There can only be one winner. For this event, it was third platoon. For the losers, the consequence is what's known as corrective training. It just reinforces that winning matters. Stay with the count. Three. Sound the fuck off. Four. Your next task is to bell the bunker. The dimensions for the bunker are going to be five wide in the front, two sandbags deep, and three sandbags tall. The team that builds this bunker to standard in the quickest amount of time will be the winners. Get ready! Go! Go! Everybody's got to pull their weight. You know, just like when they get to their first unit of assignment, you got to pull your own weight. Give your platoons their reward. The forward launch. The forward launch. After two events without a win, second platoon doesn't have time to relax. Their next task is to resupply the bunker with the supplies they carried through the woods. Build it exactly as you found it back at the road. Nearly an hour has passed since they had 30 seconds to memorize how the gear was arranged. Get ready, go! Oh, 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 Four high, one in the middle between the two on top. Hey. Work together. Oh, you're going to mess it up. Work oh, together. Oh, 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 it's just a mentally challenging event. That was three long, right there. Three long. Test and assess the mental capabilities of these individuals under stress now, and then you know see how far they come 22 weeks from now. It was three, four, three, four, two, one. Yeah. Make Whoa, a decision. Let me do it. How could that be applicable in combat? It could be as small as you have to be able to remember where the closest piece of cover behind you was. Just put something on top of it so it stays. Let's go. Once you're put in the stressful environment, now you have to remember something from before and you have to act. Like that. I'm putting in the effort, you better do. Great, 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 great. Every platoon has deficiencies. However, the closest platoon to being correct one second for two. Yeah! 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 Right, Keep that military bearing, right? Now go back to free rest. Draw sergeant. Give your platoons their rewards. One, two, three, three. One, two, three, four. Hey man, doesn't mean because we won this one. Alright, you can be up here, but stay humble, alright? Yes, if we win this next one, we have a good chance of taking the whole thing and getting that reward. Do you guys want that reward? Yes, I promise you it was a pretty damn good one. All right? All right? Yes, Sergeant! The final event simulates a medical evacuation where the trainees race to move all the sandbags to a finish line. You will use the letters. One casualty is six sandbags. So you can only transport six sandbags at a time. What I want is six men, stage ready to go each time. A win for second platoon would clinch an overall victory. Go, 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 Let's go, baby, let's go! Come on, six men!
costly stumble could ruin their chances. Things looked bleak when first platoon celebrated as though they'd won. Go, go, go. What platoon do you think did the best across all the events combined? Yeah! I keep hearing second platoon, which is wild because points accumulated, they took first place. Hey, fix it, relax. So over the next 72 hours, every meal, they will be the first platoon to eat for the next three days. On top of that, they will also not come down here to clean up all the sandbags and everything later today. That'll be first, third, and fourth platoon. That is their reward. Individual soldier discipline, military bearing, you understand? Yes, sir, soldier. We're going to win everything the whole cycle. You still stay humble, all right? Yes, sir, soldier. We want them to be motivated, absolutely. Motivated soldiers are better soldiers. Stay humble while you're here. But there also needs to be some a humble aspect to a soldier. Humble but not passive, you know, same as aggressive but not reckless. And that's what that drill sergeant's getting at is, is ensuring that military bearing's there and staying humble. The first 100 yards concludes with a demonstration performed by active infantry soldiers. This is what perfect looks like. Now you've got 22 weeks to work and develop yourself. Ooh. You become that perfect infantryman, which is what they see. Drill starts. Take charge of your platoons. Man, your 22 weeks starts today. Yes, sir, Sergeant! This is the moment right before these Navy recruits experience the full effects of tear gas. Red line, red line only, mask up, cup up. Mask up, cup up, let's go. <laughs> It's definitely a shock because when you're in there, you have your mask on and you can't feel anything. But as soon as you take it off, then it all just hits you at once. <laughs> Experiencing CS gas, more commonly known as tear gas, is a standard exercise that happens four weeks into their 10-week boot camp. <laughs> to teach recruits about the effects of the gas, and how to properly use a gas mask. It happens here at Recruit Training Command Great Lakes inside the Confidence Chamber. Insider visited Navy RTC in May, and for the first time ever, our crew was allowed to film inside any branch or agency's tear gas chamber. And experience the effects of CS gas for ourselves. This is called the confidence chamber. Okay? I don't call it the gas chamber. I don't call it the torture chamber. It's none of that stuff. It is the confidence chamber. Reason being is we're teaching you how to wear M50 gas masks. Reason you go through this is so we can prove to you that the mask works. Does that make sense? Yes, Chief! Recruits spend more than two hours in the classroom learning how to properly don their gas masks before stepping foot in the confidence chamber. Right, and I got an old saying with the confidence chamber with the M50 gas mask in general, life is better with a proper seal. And you're gonna shortly find out why. Understand? Yes, Chief! Is everybody ready on a moment's notice? Yes, Chief! Gas, gas, gas. 15, 14, 13, 12, 4, Three, two, one, stop. Is everybody ready to go? Yes! Donning their gas masks, the recruits head inside the confidence chamber. Now commencing this afternoon's confidence chamber evolution. Heels on the red line! Heels on the red line! The recruits wait for their turn to step to the line at the front of the room. 
an instructor breaks open a CS capsule over a hot plate, which burns the powder inside and fills the room with gas. They feel the effects of the CS gas within seconds, and every recruit handles it differently. It pretty much instantly hits you. It feels like an eternity, I guess, in a sense, but not really. It's right away. <laughs> get that mask up! Get that up! As soon as you take off that mask, you get that big waft of the CS gas. So it's a little bit spicy. You start feeling a little tingle in your nose, feeling a tingle in your eyes, you start your breathing complications. That's why we tell them to breathe normal, blink your eyes as much as possible. Don't take a deep breath. <laughs> your nose will be running, your throat will get itchy, your eyes will burn a lot. It hurts, burns a lot. <laughs> They're instructed to cup their hands under their chins to prevent bodily fluids from leaking onto the floor. I was looking forward to that challenge. Like, can I take it? Is it that bad? So when it finally came up to it, it was kind of just like my mom cooking in the kitchen, you know, all the seasonings and stuff, just sweating it out. <laughs> Recruits must say their names and division number, followed by a hoo before they're able to leave. <laughs> After about 15 seconds of exposure to the gas, they're allowed to exit the chamber. Keep it moving, keep it moving. You made it. Just keep blinking, just keep blinking. Just keep blinking. I'm good. Just keep... <sighs> Once outside, the effects of the gas wear off within a few minutes. It was exciting, I'm not gonna lie. I was actually excited to do it. Some of us had some more excess coming out uh, than others of our nose and mouths, but I don't think it was too bad. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. I was bracing for completely incapacitated, not able to see anything. It definitely wasn't fun, definitely wouldn't you know, sign up to do it again, but it was bearable. Booyah, 215! Booyah, 215! Booyah, where y'all at? Where my man yoman at? <laughs> but in order to truly understand the effects of CS gas, Insider Chief Video Correspondent Graham Flanagan decided it was time to experience the confidence chamber himself. For years I've been filming different armed forces branches and law enforcement agencies undergoing exposure to tear gas and I've never been able to go in and experience it for myself. I think that now that I've got this access here at Navy Recruit Training Command, I want to be able to experience those feelings that those recruits feel and be able to describe what those feelings are like. I am nervous for the initial shock of the exposure of the gas and definitely for those hopefully limited amount of minutes afterwards where I'm feeling those effects. Anything else? Uh, no, let's get it over with. burns the eyes. The eyes are really burning big time. Oh, it hurts to close the eyes and, or to open them. It's just, you can't even, I can't even figure out what to do, close or open them. It's not fun. It's not fun. And when you have that gas mask on, you don't feel anything. And, uh, and, and, but when you take it off, it took, it took honestly, like, it felt like two or three seconds before I, it's, I started to feel anything. 
I was like, when's it gonna happen? And then, then it hits you. And then when you start talking, that makes it even worse. Graham Flanagan, chief video correspondent, this is inside. When I started to speak, it triggered like painful sensations in my throat. And I was kind of like, what's going on right now? Before I had to like force it out. I don't know how much time's elapsed, but it's really starting to wear off. Now I can like, my eyes are starting to open up more. I, I'm still crying, but I can just feel it just starting to, to go away. This is not fun to do. It was painful. I really appreciate the fact that they're willing to expose themselves to it, and hopefully they never have to experience it again. But yeah, I, I, feel, I feel fine. Hey, let's go, hey, let's go! These Army trainees are participating in a combatives competition against other platoons in their company. It's one of the last events trainees experience during basic combat training, where they learn to engage the enemy from a variety of distances. You never know what type of enemy you're coming into contact with. Come on! You ain't trying to win, Pete! Then you go under, never over with the prep hand, set it in and do it, right? Yes, I do. In the Modern Army Combatives Program, or MACP, trainees are taught fighting techniques including strikes, takedowns, and submissions like chokeholds. Whenever they have to close in at that zero meter range on the enemy, the tools they have to build that confidence, to be able to know what they need to do when the time comes, when someone either grabs their weapons or you know they get taken to the ground, what they can do to protect themselves. And then I curl the wrist. He's already almost wanting to tap. See how fast the red is? And now I draw my elbows in and he's tapping. Okay? Yeah, I'm fine. So someone's reaction time between you being 25 meters away from me, it's gonna be a two second span. So having those tools in the bag of, okay, my weapon system wasn't up fast enough. You know, this guy's already on top of me. So it's just giving them that tool to be able to know what to do with that zero meter range. On top of learning combatives with their hands, trainees are taught to fight with pugil sticks which simulates using a bayonet to deliver a lethal blow. <laughs> Trainees put their combative skills to the test in a company-wide pugil stick competition as they near the end of their basic combat training. Trainees can win in two ways. The fighter who delivers a disabling blow wins, or the instructor can stop the fight and declare a winner. Winner, my submission. We're looking for major hit areas like jabs to the face, the neck, or the stomach area. So their main focus is to maintain their fighter stance on their feet so that they're not letting their opponent knock them over. Because if they can take control and maintain control of a situation, they'll be able to pull their self out of the situation or dominate their opponent. If the opponent falls, then they're disqualified because they were unable to maintain their fighter stance in that match. The platoon that wins the most fights receives a reward. You ain't trying to win, Pete! You ain't doing it for the platoon! You ain't doing it for the platoon! Let's go! The winner of each match remains in the ring until they are defeated by another opponent. Winner by most is able to One trainee lasted longer than the rest. And I'm Daniel Ruiz. Uh, there was a lot of uh, adrenaline rush. rush. My thoughts of protecting myself and providing a proper strike was all into my game plan. I, tr I did a Superman punch in one of my fights. Uh, uh, my uh, senior drill sergeant saw me execute, and I was really happy I was able to uh, hit with that strike. It was one of my favorite strikes. Ruiz, he has a lot of strength behind him, and he also maintained his breathing as much as he could. Well, a lot of times, he would get the first disabling blow, which gives him the win. And that shows us that he is he's not afraid to get in there and finish the fight and make a strike if need be.
after his seventh fight, Ruiz appeared to be exhausted. Sit down. Sit down, Pablo. My drill sergeant saw me, uh, saw him gassing up. He gave me motivation in order for me to push forward, saying I had the strength in, in order to overcome the obstacles. Kept pushing forward until my last fight. That's when my gas time gave up, and that's when I started absorbing more blows. In his eighth fight, Ruiz finally lost. It was one of the most fun experiences I've had. I always wanted to know what that felt like, having a crowd behind your back, cheering you up and keep having you keep going and just making myself uh, proud. Think about that, Ruiz. It took eight people to bring you, one person, down. You have the power of eight people inside of one. We want to know the strength of all of your team members. We get down to showing and recognizing the person as an individual and what they can bring to the platoon moving forward. Another fighter was quickly catching up to Ruiz's record. With seven wins under his belt, trainee Garcia was now fighting in his eighth match of the day. And with this win, he beat Ruiz's record, securing the overall win for his platoon. I want to recognize the both of them because they did very, very, very well. However, the winner overall is Private Garcia platoon. Garcia's platoon will receive the honor of having a streamer placed on its platoon flag during the turning green ceremony at the end of basic training. For the competition, something that keeps them going is the streamer. It gives them the ability to say, hey, we did good as a platoon, and it builds the morale towards winning honor platoon. You've made it. All right, you are now United States soldiers. We're near our BCT portion of OSET graduation, so it's called Turning Green. This is where they become soldiers in the Army and moving into training on their specialized skill as a tanker. It feels amazing. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of tears, a lot of work that we put in to get here, but we just keep pushing forward in order for us to become U.S. soldiers and make ourselves and our families proud. Yeah!